genes, development, and evolution. And for further information, you can go to uh, evolutionarily uh, evolutionary developmental biology, the uh, the uh, individual article on Wikipedia. All right, so continue further. So development is the process by which a multicellular organism, plant, or or animal goes through a series of changes, starting from a single cell and taking on various forms that are characteristic of its life cycle. There are four key processes that underlie development. Determination, differentiation, morphogenesis, and growth. Uh, determination sets the developmental fate of a cell, which becomes more restrictive during development. Yeah, so basically it picks the path. And then differentiation is the process by which specialized cells uh, are formed uh, yeah, I added this uh, just because uh, it looks like this, this made a typo here. Uh, so specialized cells from less specialized uh, stem cells, such as uh, stem cells. I mean, uh, less spe specialized cells, such as stem cells. Yeah, so just fix that uh, sentence So uh, from Wikipedia. Differentiation is a process by which uh, specialized cells are formed from less specialized cells, such as stem cells. Uh, stem cells are undifferentiated, undifferentiated or partially differentiated uh, cells that can differentiate into various types of cells and proliferate uh, indefinitely to produce more of the same stem cell. Yeah, basically specialized cells uh, focus on one specific uh, characteristic uh, or type, while uh, undifferentiated can uh, can uh, can specialize into uh, many different types. So basically, it it is uh, it hasn't been selected, or its path is is more general for the unspecialized, or I mean, or, or the uh, undifferentiated. And then and then if he wants to make, let's say, for example, a lung uh, cells, it would it would uh, differentiate uh, specifically to that type of cell, and then those will keep producing the same type. Yeah, but the less differentiated, so you can do partially, or if it's uh, completely undifferentiated, it can it can pretty much form any type of cell. Uh, that basically it differentiates itself into any any type of cell, lung cell, uh, heart cell, etc. Yeah, which is a quite interesting uh, concept. So continuing further, so cellular differentiation dram dramatically changes a cell's size, shape, membrane potential, which is a difference in electrical potential slash charge concentration between the interior and exterior of a cell. Uh, the metabolic uh, activity and its and responsiveness to signals, which are largely due to highly controlled modifications in gene expression and epigenetics. With a few exceptions, uh, cellular differentiation almost never involves a change in the DNA sequence itself. Thus, different cells can have very different uh, physical characteristics despite having the same genome, which is very interesting. And uh, this is uh, correlates to uh, the epigenetics. So uh, in biology, epigenetics is the study of heritable phenotype or the uh, outward characteristics uh, changes that do not involve alter alterations in the DNA sequence. You're not changing the actual DNA, but you can still change how the uh, how how the yeah, the genetic code is expressed uh, physically in the characteristics. So here's a epigenetic uh, mechanisms here. Here's an illustration of this. We'll make this uh, maybe we'll just zoom in again. So we're going to zoom in. All right, so epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, so they are affected by these factors and processes. So development in utero uh, or, or in a uterus or in uh, childhood. And also uh, environmental chemicals can affect it. Uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals, aging and diet. Yeah, where again, the DNA sequence not changed, but you can still change the outward appearance. So if, for example, here's a chromosome right here. And then if you, if you look into a specific strand of uh, this uh, DNA strand or this uh, chromatin, which is again that bundled up uh, of uh, DNA. And then, uh, yes, yeah, so you look at that chromatin, and if you zoom in further, you get something like this. So you have DNA, and then you have this uh, mechanism, DNA methyl methylation, uh, which is, uh, yes, yeah, so you have a methyl group and epigenetic, uh, which is an epigenetic factor found in some dietary sources and can tag DNA and activ activate or repress genes. So you're not actually changing the sequence, but you have this, uh, this molecule attached to it and it can activate or uh, repress or stop the genes. And uh, basically, if you zoom into how this uh, chromatin is set up, so you have uh, histone proteins there. Those are the four, four by two. So you have four in, in each spool and you have another four. No, yeah, actually, it's not. Uh, it's not four. It's, it's eight here. So there's four here and then four behind it. And if you just go refresher on histone, uh, there. Let's go to the histone. 
uh, click this over here and move over. Yes, yeah, so remember we had the histones. Uh, so you had four proteins uh, like this on top and then four at the bottom. And then yeah, you have a histone octamer. So a set of four proteins or eight proteins. Yes, yeah, so a set of eight proteins. And you have this uh, DNA is going to be uh, looped around these uh, eight proteins over there. And then, then basically the forming a nucleosome or the um, basic building block of uh, the chromatin, which again, DNA is stranded around it. Let's get back. Uh, to this uh, app, a genet. Oops, app. Yeah, there it is. Okay, let's just exit, and we're back here. Oh, wait, so we have the histones there. Yes, yeah, so each one of these is a histone, and yeah, each of them uh, is a protein. So you have eight proteins, right? Histones, uh, all uh, yeah, being spooled, and then you have the DNA being spooled around them. So, anyways, you have this, and uh, yeah, so histones are proteins uh, around which DNA can wind or or for compaction and gene regulation. So, for example, you can regulate genes here. So, if you have a histone like this around. Uh, so, and then you have a DNA, which is inaccessible uh, uh, over here, which is in between these two, um, yeah, uh, these two spools. So you have a spool here and a spool here, and this one's, uh, it, it could be viewed as a DNA is in, inaccessible. So then, then, then basically the gene is inactive. Yeah. So in this setup, it's an inactive, but then when you have, uh, when you modify this histone, so histone modification, the binding of epigenetic factors to histone, uh, quote, tail. So these are protrusions from a, uh, histone, uh, so the protein, it's not just always uh, just, just compact like that. It also has an extended uh, tail there. Yeah, so it's a binding of epigenetic factors. The histone, quote, tails alters the extent to which DNA is wrapped around uh, histones and the availability of genes in the DNA to be activated or uh, transcribed. Yeah, so if you have a compact like this, but then uh, when you have these uh, these tails that, that uh, shoot outwards, uh, and then if you have an epigenetic factor uh, connected to it, like even a, a DNA methyl group like that, or just a methyl group or another uh, molecule on it, then it's not going to compact as well. So you're going to have an open gene. So this one was initially in in inaccessible here, and now it is accessible. So DNA is accessible uh, and hence active, and it could be transcribed. Let's keep uh, scrolling fa uh, up uh, above. Yeah, so that's an epigenetic factor, and uh, so so the health endpoints or the ultimate uh, effect of this uh, epigenetic uh, mechanisms. You have uh, you could have cancer, autoimmune disease, mental disorders, or even uh, diabetes. Yeah, which is a very interesting, uh, yeah, interesting, yeah, to think about. So let's zoom out now, and let's just go over uh, more notes. One more zoom, I think. Okay, zoom out, or one more. All right, so we're back back in business. All right, so, uh, so this methyl group that you're adding uh, to this DNA, and you can modify it. Again, you're not modifying the exact sequence, but you can modify the endpoints. And then sometimes it's uh, you can have negative effects you know, based on these uh, factors that uh, attach to the proteins that uh, the DNA spools around. So a methyl group is derived from uh, methane CH4 by removing one hydrogen, uh, thus containing the chemical formula dash CH3. So you get methane, uh, remove the hydrogen, and you get CH3. Uh, chromatin, yeah, the chromatin we already went over. It's just a complex of DNA and protein found in eukaryotic cells. So that's chromatin like that, and it's uh, spooled around. Uh, so you have the DNA plus the proteins. And now go over uh, so that histone. So uh, so this is from uh, this website here, bio nineteen oh three which is <laughs> on a pretty good image of it. So here's histone tails protrude from the histones. So if you have this. Yeah, uh, electron micrograph uh, image of DNA double helix like that. Uh, that's two uh, nanometers in diameter. So again, that's two uh, billionth of a meter. Uh, so then you have DNA the double helix like that. Zoom into it, and uh, what you have histones with a tail protruding outwards on each protein, and then you uh, when you combine them over into the eight eight setup like that into the or the octamer. So the histone octamer, and then you, what you get is a nucleosome uh, setup. So these are the nucleosome uh, structure at 10, uh, and then it's uh, 10 nanometers in diameter. So five times uh, the diameter of the DNA yeah, without the uh, histones in between. So it's, it's pulled around it. Notice the tails protruding out of each one. And then when you have something like that, and there's an H1 protein of the type of histone. And then when you spool them all together, you get something like a huge bundle like that. Yeah, the, the, this setup is the nucleosome's uh, structure, so or uh, beads on a string, 10 nanometer fiber. So anyways, continue further. So just to uh, go over more info on this uh, tails, make this a bit bigger. 
So what we have is histone tails protrude outward from a nucleosome. So you have the DNA uh, double helix uh, loop, uh, looped around it. And then you have the amino acids available for chemical modification on the uh, histone uh, proteins. And the, uh, I mean, uh, histone tails. And there's the histone tails like that. And again, the protrude, uh, this is all, all part of how the actual protein looks like. And then, yeah, notice this uh, lumped up structure like that. So what, what uh, another setup you could have is uh, uh, this is uh, acetylation. Yeah, or uh, acyl acetylation. I mean, acetylation. Uh, this is uh, acetylation of histones. Tails promote loose chromatin structure that permits transcriptions. Basically, you're adding uh, this uh, acetyl group or acetyl group uh, to this histone setup. And it connects it to the tails and then it opens it up. So then instead of spooling up like this, making the genes in inaccessible, a lot of the genes inaccessible, opens up like this. Now you have some accessible genes. And then you have, this is uh, unacet uh, unacetylated histones and then you have acetylated histones. We notice how it's spread out and they don't spool together and they're protruding out like that. It's quite fast. So similar to the setup right here. So you have bundled, bundled up in uh, inaccessible genes and then you can regulate it by putting these on them. And then they open up and now you have accessible genes. Yeah, all right, so let's uh, read the description here. Again, this is from that same uh, source or similar website or similar link, but on the same site. Uh, so, but this is on the uh, ac acetylation. Yeah, or on the uh, acetylation uh, uh, webpage of that uh, bio1903nicerweb.com website. So, chromatin modification enzymes can add a negative uh, ac acetyl. Yeah, negative uh, acetyl groups, uh, which are again uh, dash C C O C H three to histone tails. Histone ac uh, acetylation loosens chromatin uh, chromatin structure, making the DNA accessible to transcription. Such chromatin modifications may be passed to future generations of cells in a process called epigenetic inheritance. So again, notice the sequence of the sequences of the DNA is not changed; just the protein itself is modified, which the DNA spools around it. Now you can activate or de deactivate depending on. Uh, depending on what, uh, how, which genes are accessible or not accessible. Or just, yeah, just basically like uh, looking at this structure right here. So they have a lot of inaccessible genes. You open it up, you can have some accessible genes like that. Again, without modifying the DNA itself. So an autoimmune disease, this is over here. So this is the cancer or the health points, health endpoints. So this is autoimmune disease. Just go over what that is. Uh, so an autoimmune disease is a condition arising from abnormal immune response to a functioning body part. Interesting. So continue further. So diabetes uh, mellitus or DM so for diabetes. So yeah, diabetes is another health endpoint. And so you have diabetes uh, mellitus uh, DM, commonly known as just diabetes, is a group of metabolic disorders characterized by a high blood sugar level over a prolonged period of time. Yes, uh, very interesting stuff. So now, uh, uh, next one is to look at cancer. Yeah, cancer is a group of diseases uh, involving abnormal cell growth with the potential to invade or spread uh, spread to other parts of the body. Interesting. So let's continue further. So morphogenesis, a uh, number of the development stages. So we went over this. This is, was the uh, epigenetics, which is a major component of cell cellular uh, differentiation, which dramatically changes the cell's size, shape, membrane potential, uh, metabolic activity and responsiveness to signals which are largely due to highly controlled modifications in gene expression and epigenetics and with a few uh, exceptions cellular uh, differentiation almost never involves a change in dna so such as epigenetics like that yeah so we went from uh, determination right here is just uh, s selecting the path and then differentiation is to is the actual process of, of getting from uh, non-specialized to specialized cells and now the next one is morphogenesis and then after that is growth Let's go over morphogenesis uh, right here. So morphogenesis or development of uh, body form is the result of spatial differences in gene expression. Uh, specifically, the organization of differentiated uh, tissues into specific structures such as arms or wings, which is known as pattern formations. You're actually forming the, the body form. So yes, yeah, spatial differences such as arms are spatially uh, spread out of, uh, have a spatial uh, uh, cell set up that's different from your heart, for example. So it's like instead of a round blob, you have an extended uh, uh, tissue length, like uh, your arm. Yeah, so specifically the organization of differentiated tissues into specific structures uh, such as arms or wings, which is known as pattern formation, uh, is governed by uh, morphogens, which are signaling molecules that move from one group of cells to surrounding cells, creating a morphogen gradient uh, as described by the French flag model. Let's click this one. Well, here's one. A model of concentration gradient building up. 
uh, fine yellow orange outlines are cell boundaries. So here is cells growing bigger and bigger, and there's the uh, orange. Uh, yeah, so the fine orange ones are the uh, cell bound boundaries. Yeah, so you have cells opening up and getting bigger uh, or just expanding out. And notice there's the different forms that you're shaping up like this. And yeah, it's very fast. And see when it starts from the beginning. All right. I right, continue further. So, MS note in the French flag model, the French flag is used to represent the effect of a morphogen on cell differentiation. A morphogen affects cell states based on uh, concentration. Uh, these states are represented by the different colors of the French flag model. High concentrations activate a quote blue gene. Yes, you have a blue gene here. Uh, lower concentrations activate a quote white gene. Uh, yeah, so yeah, let's see if we can see a white one there. Yeah, so there's some. Um, it's hard to see any white one, uh, but basically, yeah, so notice that's light blue there. So this one's a lower uh, concentration of that blue gene, etc. And yes, the lower concentrations activate a white gene with red serving as a default state in cells uh, below the necessary concentration threshold. And uh, yeah, this gradient is a morphogen uh, gradient that are signaling molecules yeah, that move from one uh, group of cells to surrounding cells and then basically activates uh, different genes. So you have a spread out like this and a model of concentration uh, gradient building up so initially it's signaling over to other ones this one's gonna be the red gene this one's more in the uh, whitish gene and you have the blue gene over there uh, which one is, is signaling to express so again it depends if it's the arms if it's the not the arms just the body it's going to be different uh, genes that are being expressed and uh, and it's going to be uh, spatially different so you're gonna have spatial difference in gene expression uh, which represents the body form and this is the french flag uh, uh, yeah, this is the French flag. So the f flag of France is a three-colored triband. So basically three bars or three bands, blue, white, and red. And that's where it's named after. Yes, yeah, so you have the red. There it is, the blue, and uh, white is uh, presumably yeah, somewhere in between. That's yes, interesting. Interesting. Let's make this a bit smaller. Uh, so going further, and the next one is... Uh, 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 yeah, continue further. Let's look at apoptosis or programmed cell death. Uh, this also occurs during morphogenesis as part of morphogenesis, such as the death of cells between digits, uh, such as fingers and toes, and human uh, embryonic development, which frees up uh, individual fingers and toes. An expression of transcription factor genes can determine organ placement in a plant, and a cascade of transcription factors themselves can establish body segmentation in a fruit fly. It's very interesting. So here's a basically a program cell death in between so that they uh, yeah, die off. And if you don't have that, you're going to have a, a conjoined uh, fingers like that. So, yeah, so this word uh, syndactyly is a condition wherein two or more digits are fused together. So you have the fingers like that. That's a pretty uh, crazy uh, condition right there. And this image I got it from, it's this one. The uh, axon of the squid.wordpress.com. <laughs> so, syndactyly of the human hand, uh, this is from Flat 1994. So, yeah, there's basically you have program cell death. If you don't, uh, you're going to have this uh, connection here, or you have, or if it's set up like this, it's incomplete. It is a complete fusion. This is an incomplete fusion, just uh, partially in between. Pretty crazy stuff. And a transcription factor or sequence specific DNA binding factor is a protein that controls the rate of transcription of genetic information from DNA to messenger RNA by binding to a specific DNA sequence. So you bind to it and going over here, so expression of transcription factor genes can determine organ placement in a plant and a cascade of these factors uh, can establish uh, body segmentation in a fruit fly. And basically it's a protein transcription factor is a protein that controls the rate of transcription of genetic information from DNA to messenger RNA and, uh, and it binds to a specific DNA sequence. It's very fascinating, fascinating stuff. Yeah, and these can specify organ placements and so on. Let's continue further. So cell growth, yeah, which is the next uh, setup right there. Because so we have uh, we have morphogenesis, and then we have cell growth after that. So going back up to here, the four stages. And yeah, so there are four key processes that underlie development, determination, differentiation, morphogenesis, and growth. And uh, yeah, so the, the growth one wasn't included in that biology Wikipedia page. So I just went to uh, directly here just... Uh, just I put it in this MES note. So cell growth refers to an increase in the total mass of a cell, including both uh, cytoplasmic, nuclear, and organelle volume. Cell growth occurs when the overall rate of cellular biosynthesis is greater than the overall rate of cellular degradation. 
Uh, cell growth is not to be confused with cell division or the cell cycle, which are distinct processes that occur alongside cell growth during the process of cell proliferation, where a cell known as the mother cell grows and divides to produce two daughter cells. Importantly, cell growth and cell division can also occur independently of one another. Yes, cell growth is, is, is actually getting bigger, so the cells get bigger and so on. Very fascinating. So here's a comparison of uh, cell, yeah, of cell growth and cell division. So here's the setup. So if you have cell division right here, you have a cell and it splits up into two like that. And then these, or into four right here, that's cell division. And then if you have these uh, here, they, they split up into another four each. Yeah, so cell division, growth, and proliferation. Note that mass increases with cell proliferation. And yeah, going here. So now if you have cell growth, the cell just gets bigger. Now if you have cell growth and cell division, so you have both of these, cell pro proliferation, yeah, that's called cell pro proliferation. The, uh, it divides and gets bigger. So for example, here, cell division, these are, these are four smaller ones, just an example. Now here, this cell gets split into two, but now they're two of equally size. In other words, this is bigger. So the cells itself got bigger. Yeah, so, so the mass increases with cell pr proliferation. So the mass is double. Now this one's double again. This one, the mass is always the same. And this is uh, yeah, bigger. And it's basically dividing each time, but notice the size is the same, so you're doubling the mass each time. Fascinating. So a small fraction of the genes in an organism's uh, genome called, uh, yeah, in an organism's genome called the Developmental Genetic Toolkit control the development of that organism. Yeah, so uh, this is a uh, yeah, small fraction of the genes have this specific setup right there and that control the development. Uh, these toolkit genes are highly conserved among phyla or that taxonomical group, uh, meaning that they are ancient and very similar in widely separated groups of animals. Uh, differences in deployment of toolkit genes affect the body plan and the number, identity, and pattern of body parts. Among the most important toolkit genes are the uh, Hox genes, uh, and then the Hox genes determine where repeating parts, such as the many vertebrae of snakes, will grow in a development in a developing embryo or larva. And a larva, plural larvae, uh, or larvae, is a distinct juvenile form many animals undergo before metamorphosis into adults. And uh, metamorphosis morphosis is a biological process by which an animal physically develops after birth or hatching, involving a conspicuous and relatively abrupt change in the animal's structure through cell growth and differentiation. Yeah, and the, the word conspicuous yeah, just uh, means uh, obvious. So basically an obvious and relatively abrupt change in animal structure through cell growth and differentiation occurs. And an example that's uh, yeah, always used is over here. This is from, where is this a link from? This is from gardenswithwings.com. Very interesting website. So you have here, so you have an egg right there. One is an egg. Then you have a larvae, which is caterpillar. And then what happens is this is, this is the black swallowtail butterfly life cycle. So you have a larva, which is a caterpillar, and then it forms a pupus or a chrysalis, you know, or a chrysalis, or the pupa. So basically, it yeah, forms this, uh, this little uh, shell of itself, so it combines in, into this, and then eventually just had to just uh, transforms or metamorphosizes into an adult, which is a butterfly. So this is an abrupt change, and it's, uh, and it's conspicuous or obvious change. So you go from an egg to a caterpillar to this, um, you know, to this pupa, yeah, or uh, pupa, I think that's how you pronounce it. And then, yeah, so it transforms into this uh, butterfly. So you go from a caterpillar to an egg, but a caterpillar, this pupa set up, and all of a sudden you have a butterfly, which is absolutely remarkable. That's fascinating stuff. Anyways, continue further. So variations in the toolkit may have produced a large part of the morphological evolution of animals. The toolkit can drive evolution in two ways. A toolkit gene can be expressed in a different, in a different pattern, yeah, as when the beak of Darwin's uh, large ground finch, a type of bird, was enlarged by the BMP gene, which is a bone morphogenic, uh, yeah, yeah, which stands for bone morphogenetic, morphogenetic proteins, uh, and this uh, stimulates cell proliferation. Or when the snakes lost their legs as dis distal less or DLX genes, which are morpho morphological transcription genes, became underexpressed or not expressed at all in the places where other reptiles continued to form limbs. Yeah, so the toolkit gene could be expressed in a different pattern, such as uh, Darwin's uh, 
Uh, this this uh, Darwin's large ground finch was enlarged by this BMP gene. Yeah, so it's exp expressed in a different pattern in this case we're using B BMP gene or when snakes lost their, uh, their, their uh, these genes right here, distal uh, DLX genes. Oh, or yeah, when they either lost their uh, yeah lost their legs as part of uh, these genes, which became underexpressed or not expressed as all at all, where other reptiles continue to form limbs. So basically, uh, the snakes lost their uh, their le limb or, or the other limbs uh, slash legs as uh, as be a part of their supposed evolution. So or the other way a toolkit can uh, can drive evolution is the second way is the first way is expressing a different pattern. So let's put a bold right here, different patterns. So you're expressing different genes. Uh, the toolkit can drive evolution two ways, uh, expressed in a different pattern. So I'll actually put a space here. So tool can be expressed in two ways. Yeah, so the way, way right here, I'm just going to bold this as well, just so we make it a bit easier to uh, categorize. And then or, put another space, so the second way, or tool, toolkit gene can acquire a new function. So acquire a new function, as seen in the many functions of that same gene, the distal, uh, distal list, uh, right here, this distal list genes, uh, which controls such diverse structures as the uh, mandible, uh, yeah, so uh, mandible or the lower jaw, yeah, the mandible or lower jaw in vertebrates, uh, legs and antennae in the fruit fly and eye spot pattern in butterfly wings. Yeah, so basically the first setup is a is different pattern of uh, gene expression, uh, such as expressing or, or underexpressing or not expressing uh, these specific genes, these distal list genes, or the toolkit gene uh, can acquire a new function. So the distal list gene can actually acquire new ones, such as uh, the mandible, uh, lower jaw and vertebrates, legs and antennae in the fruit fly, and eye spot pattern and butterfly wings. Uh, given that small changes in uh, toolbox genes can cause significant changes in body structures, and I just moved it over here just to separate so that we have this uh, acquire new function, a different pattern as two ways. So anyways, given that small changes in toolbox uh, genes can uh, cause significant changes in body structures, they, uh, they have often enabled convergent or parallel evolution. That's yeah, so all you need is small changes in these uh, toolbox genes uh, that then you can, yeah, you can have, uh, yeah, you can have significant changes in body structures, and then you can have m different types of evolution here. So con convergent or parallel that are occurring pr pretty much at the same time. Con so, I mean, just note, convergent uh, evolution is the independent evolution of similar features in the species or in species of different periods or e epochs uh, in time. And divergent evolution or divergent uh, the selection, we're going to go to parallel soon, is the accumulation of differences. So this one is accumulation or, or it's independent evolution of similar features. This one is uh, accumulation of differences between closely related populations within a species leading to spe speciation, which uh, become distinct species. And uh, parallel evolution is a similar development of a trait in distinct species that are not closely related, but share a similar or original trait in response to similar evolutionary pressure. And uh, here's an illustration of it. So diagram, evolution at the amino acid position yeah, so let's say we have the amino acid position. In each case, uh, the left-handed species changes from incorporating uh, alanine, uh, which is A, so amino acid A, at a specific position with a protein in a hypothetical common ancestor deduced from a uh, comparison of sequences of several species, and now incorporates serine, or uh, S right there, serine. S serine. Yeah, uh, yeah, so incorporates serine in its present-day form. And the right hand uh, species may have, yeah, may undergo divergent, parallel, or convergent evolution at this amino acid relative, uh, yeah, at this amino acid position relative to that first species. Yeah, so the key thing is this left hand species. So let's put left hand. Left hand species changes from incorporating alanine at a specific position with a protein in a hypothetical common ancestor, deduced from comparison of sequences of several species. So just hypothetical, so assuming what it had before uh, in this evolutionary history, and now incorporates serine, and now incorporates in its present day form. And the right hand side of the species, either related to it or uh, distant from it, can undergo uh, these types of uh, evolution. So you'll have, so let's say you send each one of these right at left side, so the right hand, so just compare this left hand versus right hand of, of each. So you have this one, A, amino acid position goes to S, and then you can also, you, so if you have a divergent one, you'll have uh, right here, it diverges. So this, uh, the other species would have A to T. And if you have parallel, you have two different species, both have, both have A and they both get S and they're both uh, just separated species. And then you have convergent right here. 
Yeah, this convergent one is when you have different species and they converge inward into the same uh, S right here. So instead of alanine, you have this A1. I mean, you have this T on the species as a T at the position. And then, yeah, it forms this uh, S right there. And so it's just separated. It's, notice how the, the, the arrow signs illustrate just diverging. Parallel is together. And then convergent is uh, separate. Uh, yeah, convergent is converging into the same one from different one. This one is parallel going to the same from the same. It's very fascinating stuff.